For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, hello to our friends in England, and absolutely everything is the fault of climate change. As you know, extreme cold as well as extreme heat are the result of something called man-made global warming, or heating or some such. So are floods and droughts, burgeoning populations of nasty critters, and the demise of cute ones, and so forth. But what you may not fully appreciate is that, at least to hear some people tell it, it can cause contradictory phenomena in the same place. There seems to be nothing it can't do. Here specifically, I want to draw your attention to a New York Times of the morning announcement that, quote, Chicago has a strange problem, water levels that may be both too high and too low, end quote. And when you can't find a Goldilocks solution, you know what's to blame. It is, quote, almost certainly caused by the forces that climate change has released, end quote, specifically by upending the balance between Lake Michigan and the Chicago River on both ends, quote, putting the city at risk of both surging and falling water levels, end quote. How does that work? Well, you see, climate change causes more evaporation, so there's less water in the lakes and rivers. But it also causes more evaporation, so more water falls as rain into the lakes and rivers. And which effect predominates? Well, of course, whichever one you don't want. In this case, even though the lake and river are right next to each other, climate change is supposedly emptying the lake and filling the river to the point that the lake might get so low that the river backs up into it instead of flowing out. Hasn't actually happened, you understand, but the piece assures us that it might, even while conceding that Chicago is far away from rising oceans and melting glaciers and it's not prone to hurricanes or forest fires. Still, we're told it's going to get the old one-two from climate change in the form of a soggy drought. Just as out in Oregon, climate change had caused Portland to swelter under a heat dome and is now causing it to be cool and pleasant. Just as it made Edmonton hot on Canada Day, but Toronto moderate and St. John's chilly, while late in June, Ottawa went from fairly warm to having temperatures tumble to a near-record June 22nd low. Also, a classic car race in Colorado was disrupted by unseasonal snow, which also struck Argentina. Nevertheless, the Guardian screamed, quote, Canada is a warning. More and more of the world will soon be too hot for humans, end quote. Which is a bit odd, since the satellite data now show no warming for nearly seven years, so why weren't we getting these hideous heat domes in 2014? For that matter, why wasn't the world too hot for humans in the Roman warm period, and is Canada really borderline uninhabitable? But never mind, because there's nothing climate change can't do. Thus, Michael Mann does a victory dance over the heat dome as co-author with a climate scientist with a BS from Syracuse University in public communication and public affairs, in which they concede that the science is not settled, then claim, quote, uncertainty, if anything, is a reason for taking even more significant action to reduce carbon emissions. The current heat dome is an excellent example of why, end quote. Oh, really? Yes, because they say the models are really bad at predicting them. So climate change can produce science that's settled and unsettled at once, and models that both predict everything and don't work. There's nothing it can't do. Including, many a media outlets claimed, saying that you can't blame specific innocence on climate change and then doing it anyway. Global News had, quote, Climatologists are wary of trying to attribute any specific extreme weather event to climate change, though the evolving field of event attribution is beginning to change that. But there is wide agreement among scientists that there are links between the change in climate and the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, end quote. NBC gave us, quote, with global warming making heat waves and other extreme weather events both more likely and more severe, this week's sizzling temperatures may herald a climate reality that scientists thought was still decades of the future, end quote. And National Geographic's contribution in the can't blame it but let's game was, quote, this weather pattern is complex, but the whole phenomenon has been worsened by climate change, end quote. So, we don't know, but we do. Just as we know that it caused, quote, the fourth named storm of this year's Atlantic hurricane season, marking the fourth time on record that so many powerful storms have formed before July, experts said, end quote. Notice it's not the fourth hurricane, nor is it the first time it's happened. It's just the fourth time we've had things with winds of at least 63 kilometers an hour this early in the year. Also, we're told Hawaii needs to prepare for more frequent high tide flooding which will evidently go from basically none at all to 250 days a year over the next 15 years, because apparently, until 100 years ago, global sea level had been steady for 3,000 years, except for the part where it was rising and hasn't accelerated. Still, climate change might also doom Wimbledon, as English temperatures soar toward those of other places where tennis is played. Which is a useful reminder that we're being asked to believe that fractions of a degree will turn Earth from Eden into oven. Hence the Toronto Star's quote, It's so hot that Canada's sea creatures are cooking to death in their shells, end quote. 
and the story, quote, warming may cause humans to shrink, end quote. Though unfortunately not the way you might want. Instead, we're evidently going to get shorter. Meaning if we miss our net zero targets and the Earth warms by 2 degrees centigrade, you could lose an entire kilo if you currently weigh 60. But the bad news, quote, for every degree of cooling, body size increases by 0.87%, end quote. So if we do get back to the 1970s, we're not getting net zero on the scale. This week, we also have a piece by University of Guelph professor and climate expert Ross McKittrick on Stephen Coonan's book Unsettled, specifically about the claim that he's not a climate scientist, to which Coonan rightly responds that no it is because climate's a hugely complex phenomenon requiring a great many disciplines to examine it, including Coonan's own computational physics and energy systems, which you'd think anybody but a denier of the obvious would concede was highly relevant. As McKittrick also observes, Coonan accepts a great deal of the orthodoxy, from the warming impact of greenhouse gases to standard data on warming since the 1800s, and even the handle of the hockey stick. He just doesn't think panic and abuse are helpful responses, which somehow makes him a pariah among the experts who say, and the journalists. As always, we also have a couple of items courtesy of CO2Science.org. One of them testing the impact on human diet of reducing atmospheric CO2. They looked at African wood sorrel, which, in case you didn't know, has a Latin name with a hyphen in it, Oxacus pes hyphen capri, and was a major source of calories back in our hunter-gatherer days. Under their worst, lowest CO2 scenario, quote, bulb biomass decreased by up to 80%, end quote. Just imagine if we did that to a modern staple crop. And the other CO2 science piece looks at the curious phenomenon that if the planet is warming, spring should be coming earlier and fall later in Illinois, which is a major U.S. producer of soybean and corn, despite being a northern state with a fairly small window of suitable weather. They looked at data from 1951 to 2010 and found that spring really hadn't changed in, in Illinois, except that summertime highs seem to have drifted down, reducing heat stress. So, as you see, there's nothing global warming can't do, including cool Illinois in ways that benefit the crops. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.